Hi guys, we are going to read chapter 8 now. Days, weeks, and months turned into years. Simba had just about grown up. The spots on his coat had faded long ago. A mane was growling around his head and shoulders. One night, he sat with Taimon and Pumbaa under the stars. He liked his friends and jungle well enough. But it wasn't the sort of life he wanted. Something was missing. Hakuna Matata wasn't working for him. Do you ever think about what those things are up there? Asked Pumbaa. I don't think, I know, said Taimon. Matter of factly, there's fireflies stuck in that bush, bluish black thing. Oh, said Pumbaa. I thought they were big balls of gas, millions of miles away. What do you think they are, Simba? Simba was lost in his own thoughts, remembering what his father's words were long ago. The great king of the past looked down on us from those stars. He'll always be there to guide you, and so will I. Hello, over there. Persisted. Time on. Simba, couldn't you just look at that sky forever? Simba didn't answer. He could just imagine what his father would think of him right now. He sighed so deeply that his breath scattered a whiskey pusk of milkweed into the air. A sudden wind sprang up. It carried the milkweed over the treetops, far out across the plain, and into the waiting outstretched the hand of Rafiti. The old mystic, the old wise baboon, examined the seeds. Then he hopped onto the cave and studied a panting he'd once drawn on the wall. It was a lion cup. Rafiki broke open the gourd and removed something sticky. He smeared it across the cub's head. Now the painting changed. It was no longer a cub, but a lion with a golden mane. It's time, Rafiti said, smiling, and he's prepared to leave. The next day, Pumbaa was helping Taimon hunt for bugs. They weren't having much luck. We'll find something faster, said Taimon. If we divide it up, you go this way and I'll go that way. I'd rather go that way and you go that way, said Pumbaa. But if you really want to go that way, I can stop, interrupted Taimon. Just go some way. Pumbaa trotted up to Whistling Thornbush. Maybe he'd find some ants on it. He sniffed around the prickly branches. Just then he thought, Taimon, he whooped. Over there. He heard a twig break between and turned his face to a friend. I found a whole lot of ants. Pumbaa froze. The hairs bristled on the back of his neck. And his tail stood up straight. It wasn't time on after all. It was a lioness. And she looked hungry. Time and help, he squealed. Frantic, he dug himself under a big fallen log and wedged in halfway. Taimon came running. Pumbaa, he asked, looking at his friend's thrashing hind legs. What are you doing under there? She's going to eat me, scrambled Pumbaa. Who is she, asked Taimon. Then he saw the lioness, and she was about to leap straight at him, terrified. Taimon shut his eyes, but nothing happened. He peeked out of one eye just as Simba shot from the bushes and tackled the lioness. They rolled over and over, grunted loudly. He got her, squealed Taimon, skipping around his hind legs. Oh no, she's got him. Wow, he's moving like a champ. See, Pumbaa? I told you he'd come in handy. Get her. Bite her head. All of a sudden, the lioness flipped Simba on his back, pinning him down with her paw. Simba looked at her closely. Nala? Simba? asked the lioness. Taimon watched in shock as Simba and the newcomer pranced about, roaring in delight. Hey, what's going on here? asked Taimon. Nala, you look great, said Simba. What are you doing here? What do you mean, what am I doing here? asked Nala. I thought you were dead. Nope, said Simba. Here I am. It's so good to see you, said Nala. I repeat, Taimon interrupted. What's going on here? Taimon, said Simba. Meet Nala. She's my best friend. Friend, snorted Taimon. She tried to eat us. Sorry, said Nala. I didn't know who you were. Pumbaa have just managed to free himself. Sat panting on the ground. Oh, Pumbaa, said Simba. This is Nala. Pumbaa tried to catch his breath. Pleased to meet you. Nala smiled at the warthog. Then she grew serious. Simba asked, why would Scar tell us you were dead? It doesn't matter, said Simba. I'm alive. Of course it matters, said Nala. You are the king. Pumbaa dropped at once to his knees. Your majesty, he said. I gravel at your feet. Get up, said Taimon. It's not gravel, it's gravel. And don't believe me, he's not the king. Tell him the truth, Simba. Nala urged him. Yeah, she's right, admitted Simba. Now everything's ruling, cried Taimon. It'll never be the same around here. Nala turned to Taimon and Pumbaa. Would you both excuse us for a little while? I've got to talk to Simba alone. Sure, said Taimon, in a huff. 
Come on, Pumbaa. Let's get them a little privacy. I knew it, said Pumbaa as they walked away. I knew he was a king all along. Well, I'm surprised, admitted Timon. You think you know a guy. You never told them who you were, asked Nala, when they were about ourselves. You never asked me, said Simba. Look, enough about me. How'd you get here? Things are terrible at home, said Nala. Scar has taken over. He lets the hyenas do whatever they want. Simba was shocked. It sounds awful, he said. With all the hyenas, Nala explained, it got so bad I couldn't take it anymore, so I ran away. I guess I thought I'd find something better. And you did. Me, said Simba with a big grin. Now we can have a great life together. Nala smiled sadly. It sounds perfect, Simba, but we can't. We're not all that matters. Now we're together. We can go back to Pride Rock to set things right. Nala, Simba tried to explain. I live by my new philosophy now. Hakuna Matata. It means no cares, no worries, no responsibilities. Listen to me, interrupted Nala. Forget this Hakuna Matata business. Accept your responsibilities, Simba. With you alive, Scar has no right to the throne. Simba shook his head. Nala, he persisted. I can't go back. I'm no king. You could be, Nala told him. Simba gazed deep into Nala's eyes. I missed you, Nala. I missed you too, Nala said. Let me show you around. I'm sure you'll get to like it here, he said. Come on, please. Nala followed him into the leafy sun damp junk. It's beautiful, she gasped. I can see why you like it. The whole place is like paradise. I told you, said Simba, stretching out on a soft bed of moss. This is all we need. Nala walked away. Nala, said Simba, there's one more place I want to show you. It's one of my favorite spots. He took her to a little waterfall. It's a rainbow mist. The water drops bounced and sparkled as they fell. Simba jumped onto the icy pond. Come on in, he called, slapping the water with his paw. Nala hesitated, then laughed and joined them. All afternoon, they played hide and seek in the tumbling falls. When the air grew cool, she strolled to a hilltop and watched the sunset. Nala, Simba asked, nuzzling her, stay with me. I'll go back to the world that's defeated us. Nala looked away. She couldn't stand to hear Simba talk like that. She couldn't believe Mufasa's son would turn his back on pride. You're hiding from the future, Simba, she answered. It's too hard for me to give up what's here, said Simba. You don't understand. Neither would your father. Mufasa would want you to go back, she told him. Simba blinked back his tears. My father is dead, and it's all my fault. We're going to read chapter 9. Simba couldn't sleep. His talk with Nala kept going around and around in his head. He looked over at her. She was sleeping quietly. Maybe he'd go for a little walk. It might make him drowsy. The jungle was unusually quiet. He strolled for a few minutes, then stretched out on a flat rock and gazed at the sky. It was packed with stars. I can't go back, he thought. How could I show my face in the pride? I'm no king. I can't right the wrongs of the world. And even if I tried, he sighed out loud. I'm not you, Dad. I never will be. Gradually, Simba became aware of the faint sound. The sound of someone singing a strange little tune. A Saint Sana squash banana. Wee woo nigu me. Me Amanda. He strained to hear the words. He couldn't tell what they were coming from. Something about them was sad and disturbing, so he decided to move on. In a little while, he stopped to rest again. He relaxed along a fallen log that bridged a narrow stream. Plop! A stone thrown from the shore. Narrowly missing his head, but landed on the water. Startled and annoyed, Simba saw an old baboon squatting by the side of the stream. Rafiki grinned at Simba. A saint saying squash banana with Negru Mini Amingo, he crooned. Are you following me? asked Simba. Who are you? Rafiki looked at him in the eye. The question is, he asked, who are you? Simba sighed. I thought I knew, but now I'm not sure. Well, said Rafiki, I do know who you are. You are Mufasa's boy. Bye now, he added, and scooted away through the underbrush. Simba hardly believed what he just heard. The old baboon knew his father. He had to stop him before he got away. Wait, shouted Simba. He charged through the vines and chased Rafiki up to the top of the rocky hill. You knew my father, he asked him. Rafiki shook his head. Let me correct you, he said. I know your father. Simba felt sorry that he had to give such bad news to the old baboon. 
I hate to tell you this, he said, but my father died a long time ago. Let me correct you again, Rafiki said. Your father is alive. You follow Rafiki. He knows the way. Simba's heart swelled with hope. Rafiki's name stirred up long ago memories of Pride Rock. Now, for the first time since he left home, he felt truly happy. He was going to see his father. The old baboon was surprisingly quick, and it was hard to keep up with him. One second he'd be in sight, and the next he'd be gone, as if by magic. When Simba thought he'd lost off Rafiki for good, he saw him beckoning. Hurry, don't waddle, cried out Rafiki. Mufasa's waiting. He led the way through more tangles and underbrush. At last he stopped near a deep pool screened by leafy plants and tall reeds. Is my father here? asked Simba. Rafiki hobbled up the reeds and parted them. Shh, he murmured, putting a long, bony finger to his gray lips. Look down there. Simba crept closer and closer to the still pond. The water sparkled with the reflection of the stars. Gazing at him through the stars was a lion with a golden mane. Dad, asked Simba. As he leaned forward, if he realized it wasn't his father at all, he looked at himself. Overwhelmed with disappointment, he turned to Rafiki. Was the old baboon playing some kind of mean trick? It's not my father, Simba told him. It's just my reflection. Look harder, said Rafiki. Puzzled, Simba stared into the shining water again. His reflection shimmered and gradually changed shape. It was turning into his father's image. Simba gasped. You see, said Rafiki. He lives in you, Simba. Simba looked up. It was his father's voice. Dad, where are you? He cried. Before Simba's amazed eyes, a swirl of clouds parted and Mufasa's image slowly filled the night sky. But it wasn't really his father. He could see right through him. Simba gulped. He was looking at a ghost. Dad, he asked, beginning to feel afraid. Simba, have you forgotten me? asked Mufasa. No, cried Simba. How could his father ever think that? The king's image changed again. Simba could no longer see the ghost, but instead could feel his father's presence all around him. Mufasa had become a part of the air itself. You have forgotten who you are, said the voice of Mufasa, and you have forgotten me. Oh, no, Dad, insisted Simba. He felt a sob rising in his throat. I never forget you. Mufasa's voice grew gentle. Look inside yourself, Simba. You are more than what you have been. You must take your place in the circle of life. But, Dad, I've made a place for myself here, explained Simba. I'm not who I used to be. How can I go back? Remember who you are, said his father. You are my son and the one true king. Mufasa's voice started to fade. Remember who you are? Dad, pleaded Simba. Please don't go. Don't leave me. Remember, remember, repeated the voice as it faded away. Dad, Simba called faintly. Simba searched the huge starry sky, but Mufasa was gone. Most peculiar night, eh? said Rafiki. Who appeared beside Simba once again. Looks like the winds are changing, answered Simba. Ah, sighed Rafiki. Change is good. But it's not easy, said Simba. I know I have to go back. But going back means I have to face my past. Just then, Rafiki smacked Simba with his walking stick. Ouch, yelled Simba. What'd you do that for? It doesn't matter, said Rafiki. It's the past already. Yeah, but it still hurts, said Simba, rubbing his head. Yes, the past can hurt, said Rafiki. The way I see it, you can either learn from the pain or run from it. Rafiki suddenly raised his stick again, only this time Simba ducked away. Now you're learning, said Rafiki, so what are you going to do? First, I'm going to take your stick, said Simba, and then I'm going back home. Just before dawn, Nala's voice woke Pumba and Taimon. I was calling for Simba, she told them. Is he here? Taimon looked surprised. We thought he was with you. Where'd he go? asked Pumba. I don't know, explained Nala. When did you see him last? When he was with you, said Taimon. Ha ha, interrupted Rafiki squatting an overhead tree limb. You won't find him here. The king has returned. Hearing the old baboon's words, Nala roared in delight. He was really gone back. He watched Rafiki quickly disappear into the trees. I was wrong about Simba, he thought. What's going on here? demanded Taimon. Who's the monkey? Simba's going back to challenge Scar, said Nala. Who is Scar? Who got a Scar? asked Pumbaa. No, 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 said Nala. It's his uncle. Taimon was amazed. The monkey's his uncle? No, explained Nala slowly. Simba's gone back to challenge his uncle and take his place as king. Oh, said Taimon and Pumbaa together. Taimon thought it was over. A challenge, he asked in a worried voice. You mean it might be a fight or to the death? Nala nodded sadly. Pumbaa gasped. Simba might be killed. 
You, Taman yelled at Nala. This is all because of you. You don't understand, Taman, said Nala. I don't understand, squealed Taman. You don't understand. Simba's marching off to the jaws of death, and it's all your fault. He began to sob. Nala turned to leave. Hey, said Taimon, looking up. Where are you going? I'm going with Simba, said Nala. I'm going too, said Pumbaa, like Simba, who marches off the face of death. I, too, go to meet my destiny, his faithful friend. Fine, yelled Taimon. Go, be a hero. Who needs you here anyway? No, I'm king of the jungle. Taimon stood with his arms crossed for a moment or two. Then he dashed after them. Hey, you guys, he yelled. Wait for me! Hi guys, we are going to read chapter 10. Okay, Simba reached the top of a high plateau. As he reached the edge of the Pride Lands, Pride Rock stood in the middle of the empty parched plains. Everything had been touched by the drought. The trees were almost leafless. Starving giraffes, stretching as high as possible, had eaten the branches near. The enormous ancient baboons were stripped and their stringy backs devoured the desperate, hungry elephants. The dry wind picked up and threatening clouds gathered overhead. Perhaps they were bringing rain and the wind blew his mane. Simba breathed deeply and closed his eyes. He thought of his father's words, remember, remember. Then he went down into the Pride Lands. Inside Scar's cave, Zazu was cooped up in a cage, humming mournfully to himself. Sing something with a little bounce to it, Scar ordered. I would never be treated like this by Mufasa, said Zazu. What did you say? Scar exploded. You are never going to say that name in my presence. I am the king. Yes, sir, Zazu said meekly. And, there, and then more boldly than he said, only you could rule the pride as you do you. Then said Shunzi, Fanzi, and Ed burst into the cave. You gotta do something, boss, yelled Shunzi. It's dinner time and we're out of entree. Yes, and there's no food either, cried Banzi. The hyenas are so hungry that they're ready to riot, said Shinzi. It's the lioness's jo job to hunt for food, snarled Scar. Scar. Must I do everything? He poked his head out to the cave. Sarabi, he roared. A few moments later, Sarabi arrived. Listen to those hungry stomachs out there, Scar told her. Scar, said Sarabi, there's no food in the herbs. The herds have moved on. We have no choice. We must leave the Pride Rock. We're not born anywhere, said Scar. I'm king, and I make the rules. If you are half the king Mufasa was, began Sarbi. I am ten times the king Mufasa was, roared Scar. With a powerful swipe of his paw, he knocked Sarbi to the ground. The other animals felt silent, and lightning flashed in the dark sky. High above the plain, storm clouds began to chirp. Thunder boomed, the wind howled and roared. Zap! A blinding lightning bolt scorched the earth, and the dry grasses caught fire. Swirling flames swept through the pride rock, starring into the smoky air. Scar gasped, appearing in the smoky haze like ghost. A golden mane lion approached him. Mufasa? No, it can't be, he said, backing up. You are dead! Sarabi raised her aching head. Mufasa, she asked. No, mother, said, it's Simba. It's me, Simba. You are alive, said Sarabi weakly. Simba, whispered Scar. Then he quickly recovered, recovered from his shock. Well, Simba, I'm surprised to see you. Stroke of bad timing. You're showing up when you did. I'd say I'm right on time, said Simba. Well, you know, Scar stumbled. The pressures of ruling a kingdom are no longer yours, said Simba. I've come back to take my place as king. Sorry, nephew, Scar said, but there are some who still think I'm king. He nodded to the throng of the hyenas poised for attack. Simba saw Nala and the other lioness as a ledge above, ready to spring on his head. Step down or fight, Scar, Simba yelled. Must we be violent? Your father isn't here to save you this time, said Scar. Why don't you tell him who's responsible for your father's death? Sorrow flooded Simba's heart. He took a step back and said softly, I am. A crowd of lioness gasped. It was an accident. You're guilty, said Scar. No, Simba backed away in horror and suddenly stumbled his hind legs, slipping off the back of the steep cliff. Simba, cried Nala. Scar slowly walked to the edge of the cliff and peered at Simba. Digging his claws into the rock, Simba barely held on.
Now this looks familiar, Scar mumbled. Oh yes, I remember. This is the way your father looked before I killed him. The words struck Simba with the force of a blow. A new strength surged his body with an explosive roar. He lunged at Scar. Murder, he cried out. Gripping Scar's throat, he turned toward the pride. Tell them what you just said, Scar, yelled Simba. Tell them the truth. Truth, Scar questioned. Truth is in the eye of the beholder. Simba tightened the grips around Scar's throat. Tell them. I did it, whispered Scar, barely able to breathe. Say it louder, cried Simba. I killed Mufasa, Scar yelled. With ear-piercing battle cries, the lioness lunged at Scar. Simba saw Nala spring to the side as the hyenas charged into the fray. Throughout the frightening lightning flashed and the dry grass below the pride rock turned into the sea of flames, filling the air with choking smoke and ash. Finally, the hyenas fled in defeat, leaving Simba and Scar face to face. Please don't hurt me, pleaded Scar. He had no one to help him. His back was to the cliff. I didn't kill your father. It was the hyenas. They're evil, Simba. I'm your family. Simba paused briefly, considering his uncle's plea. Run away, Scar, Simba ordered. Go and never show your face again. Yes, your majesty, as you wish, Scar said, pretending to leave. Then snarling, he spun around and struck at his nephew. Simba moved quickly. You've lost your chance, he roared. He grabbed Scar and heaved him over the edge. At the bottom, waiting at the starving hyenas, threw himself on him. The hyenas' ear laughter echoed all around. Scar was no longer their master, and within minutes, he was no more. Above Simba felt someone at his side. Welcome home, Nala said. Your mother is waiting to greet the new king. Simba muzzled her. It's good to be back. That was quite a battle, said Nala. Taiman even came to the rescue. He and Pumbaa got rid of Shinza, Banzi, and Ed. Simba smiled. And how's that zoo? Fine, Nala quipped. He's free as a bird. And they smiled at each other. It started to rain. The pounding drops out of the fire and soaked the black, smoky ground. Within minutes, sheets of water drenched the plain and girling streams snapped across the land once again. Okay, guys, we are starting chapter 11. The pride lands came back to life. The water holes overflowed and the grasses grew green and tall. A can of trees and their branches heavy with Tiny golden puffballs scented in the air. The kingla trees bloomed all around. At night, when the flowers opened, the fruit bats drank nectar. One dawn of all the animals journeyed on foot of the pride rock. Zazu circled low above them and flew out of the sight. Why are we here? A young zebra wanted to know. Be patient, said his father. Soon you will see the little prince. Look, there he is now. On top of pride rock, Simon and Pumbaa sat him in a group of lionesses. They watched as a strange old baboon spring something over the cub's head. The cub sneezed and everyone laughed. Rakui picked up the wiggling cub and moved to the edge. At once, everyone cheered and stamped to their feet. Then Raki, Rafiki raised the cub, the sun, the king of Simba and Queen Nala, high in the air. The animals fell silent and bowed to their future king. After the crowd had gone, Simba stood at the top of Pride Rock. He watched the sunset below the western hills. It was the evening once again in Africa. Everything is all right, Dad, Simba said softly. You see, I remember. He gazed upward. One by one, each star took its place in the cold night sky. And that's the end of the story. I hope that you all enjoyed this story just as much as we did.